The accomplishment I feel is the best is that he used a specific type of electret, which is a waxy substance which holds charge and um, it's like a, uh, in many ways, a magnet, electrical analog of a magnet. And he's achieved a 0.1 horsepower motor, which is a small device. So, and this runs continually on atmospheric electricity. Like the homopolar generator, the electrostatic motor is based on the dynamics of our Earth environment. As with wind and solar power, they offer real sustainable alternatives that, with only modest gains in efficiency, could contribute to the replacement of our current dependence on fossil fuels. Are we clever enough to learn from the clues our planet is providing? Upon the foundation of innovative thinkers and inventors like Tesla and Moray, the modern age of free energy research began. In the 1950s, as waves of flying saucer sightings occurred throughout the United States and while an infant space program was trying to catch up with the Russians' launch of Sputnik, a man named T. Townsend Brown was busy on experiments that defied conventional understanding about electricity, gravitation, and propulsion. Along with doctors Paul Byfield, and Agnew Bonson, Brown took high voltage to the next extreme. In this rare home movie, the earliest experiments in electrogravitics are recorded. By using high voltages over 20,000 and up to 200,000 volts, Brown discovered that highly charged capacitors would exhibit a noticeable thrust in one direction. Although awarded a patent for his electrokinetic generator, no one has ever reproduced his experiment until recently. Larry Davenport shown here demonstrating his replication of Brown's electrokinetic apparatus, explains. But when I first began to read Brown's stuff, I didn't quite understand the difference between the ion wind devices, which there's a lot of them out there, and some of them are, are very efficient as far as producing ion wind, and his particular apparatus. I finally decided to do Brown's work in, in uh, 1994, I looked at his device, I'd, I'd tried several different things and they hadn't worked, and I thought, well, Brown is supposed to be the pioneer of this, or so the people that make the claims and that uh, get the patents, they always refer to his name, so I thought, I'll go back and I'll try to do this. Getting it balanced was real important. His uh, method of propulsion specifically was using the charge separation, high voltage charge separation on a vehicle. He found that uh, circular craft were better for that application than uh, wing craft. However, um, recently we found through uh, Dr. Paula Violet's research that the B-2 bomber actually seems to qualify as an electrogravitic craft. Uh, the military has admitted that it uh, electrically charges the forward leading edge of the wings. Uh, there's also a very high dielectric being used. Depleted uranium is used on the uh, forward edge of the wings. And whether or not there are other applications for that technology and that uh, design, we're recognizing that because the exhaust gas is also negatively ionized, that all of a sudden we have the high voltage charge separation that's necessary to provide an extra propulsive force, especially at high velocities. So electrogravity uh, in that um, aspect is a very simple process, but does provide a good amount of force for a very small amount of energy input. As with many other promising inventions developed during the Cold War years, the National Secrecy Act prevented scientists like T. Townsend Brown from commercializing or even publicizing any technology which could potentially be interpreted as having a military application. The triumph of America's space exploration program gave way to the era of limits in the late 70s. The infamous energy crisis made us all aware of our dependence on finite resources. Many inventors promised dramatic results with devices they said would solve the crisis.
claims of overunity, where power output exceeds input, were routinely announced. But when put to the test, most of their crude prototypes perform poorly, or not at all. Measuring methods were, and still are, extremely difficult to perform accurately. The few that did achieve modest gains in output were dismissed by mainstream academia and denied patents. And without patent protection, investors have no financial incentive to lay out the millions of dollars it takes to mass produce and market these devices, no matter how promising the technology. And after all, classical Newtonian dynamics got us to the moon, and Einstein's E equal MC squared explained that energy could neither be created nor destroyed. Anything else which seemed otherwise was labeled perpetual motion, unworthy of scientific examination. Uh, when I started out in 1980, um, you know, free energy was something that we didn't talk about. We talked about it under behind closed doors. Uh, the conferences often were visited by people we didn't know, and, um, and the information was spread in various means so that all of a sudden nonconventional energy, which was a phrase we developed, uh, was appearing in uh, military solicitations. So it's, it's, a, it's a controversial topic that at that time actually had the connotation that there was something for nothing. Therefore, it was unscientific, and these are a bunch of lunatics who are talking, and, um, and sooner or later the scientists will educate them about what's the, um, the various laws of physics that are being violated. Well, most of the scientists equated any notion of a free energy or over-unity device as being a perpetual motion uh, machine and therefore utter nonsense. You see, it's, it's, a, it's a play on words. The scientists interpreted it one way. The guys trying to do it are looking at it as an open system. Now, fortunately today, we have a type of thermodynamics. Uh, you know, Nobel Prizes have been issued for it, to Prigogine, for example, uh, for systems not in thermodynamic equilibrium that do have. They're open systems, and the energy does flow in from outside and through them. Those kinds of systems can produce over unity. It's all perfectly legitimate physics. Today, most scientists are unaware of the literature that the zero-point energy even exists, mainly because most scientists aren't physicists. Now, a few of the, I went to school, and I became a PhD, claiming a PhD in electrical engineering and systems engineering, and not one professor ever heard of it. And yet, there it was in the library. So part of it is most scientists are specialists in their own area, and science today is very fragmented. Now, for those that know that the zero-point energy exists, they may argue, well, it's random in its nature, and therefore it can't be tapped as an energy source. But very recent work in thermodynamics by Ilya Prigogine, who won the Nobel Prize in 1978, shows how this energy could become self-organized if, if the proper systems conditions could be fulfilled. And that's what's happening in some of the experiments and some of the inventions that are tapping this, this energy and producing anomalous energy. Another resistance is the physics community, especially, that really know about this energy, realize if you could tap it, everything would change. The nature of physics would change. Uh, the, the most important foundation of all physics would then be the quantum, uh, the quantum energy that's in embedded in space, and really, we don't understand it. And it's extremely mathematically difficult to do computations in it. And it turns out it's probably going to be the basis of string theory in the future. And therefore, what seems to be nothing will actually be understood as a field effect, as a tapping of um, energy that is already available but can't be seen. Um, even the radio waves, for example, the television set is a good example. Uh, if you show that to a primitive tribe, it looks like a magical box but it's literally converting invisible energy in the air to, um, to signals and pictures. The paddle wheel in the river that's used to power a mill, grind corn, is a free energy device. So is a windmill, for example. What we mean is we are taking the energy from an external source and using it. So it's an open system, and the, the environment of the system is furnishing a flow of energy into the system which the system is then collecting and using. Primary requirements, it has to be an open system. It has to have an external source of energy to furnish the energy that we're going to use. And therefore, it's no more mysterious than a windmill. And now we're coming full circle and realizing that uh, physics and metaphysics, that um, some of the notions of the 19th century, such as the ether and the vortex, are now being dusted off. And those ideas are being melded with uh, modern experiments plus quantum mechanics and so forth into this magnificent 